Able to On Air major sponsorship was given by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Also sponsorship was given by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together, and Champlain Community Services of Vermont. Welcome to this edition of Able Dead On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled. I'm, I'm, I'm your host, Lauren Seiler. I'm Seiler. And we would like to thank our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, and Champlain Community Services. Green Mountain Support Services um, is the agency that uh, focuses on um, helping people with special needs stay at home and in, in, in the community and being independent with us to discuss this topic of um, direct support professionals and the career of being a direct support professional is can you guys introduce yourself Chelsea Bishop Brandy Carlton and you guys are service coordinators um, for many years, for a couple of years as well. Uh, uh, why don't you explain some of the work of a direct support professional and what they do? And I'm going so. to hand that question off to Brandy <laughs> because she has actually had experience in both lines of work. Mm -hmm. So the the responsibilities of a direct support professional is number one, safety of the person that they support and also giving, uh, helping giving the quality of life that they deserve and any, ta any um, everyday life tasks that they, they need to get done. And being there, being a friend, that's in my opinion, that's what a direct support professional should do is support that person in any way that they, they need. Mm -hmm. Now I understand uh, that you guys, it, well, instead of Vermont now, um, you guys are working with New York State in in a in a uh, project called E Badge Academy, which helps people get their certificate in direct support professional. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yes. So the E Badge Academy is a way for direct support professionals to get recogni recognition for the work that they've done in the field, mm -hmm. um, and they can bring that wherever they go. You know, if they decide they don't want to work with us, it's, it can go with them to whatever job they... So it's a certification. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so what they do is they submit, um, you know, a little paragraph about the work that they've done and how it applies to the code of ethics. Um, and then we have reviewers that review the badge and decide is, does it meet the requirements of the code of ethics? What is the code of ethics in this case? <laughs> I did not memorize them. <sighs> yes, so. Gosh. There are 12. There are 12. Um, Give me one of them or two of them. Uh, off the top I, of my head, I can don't. Can we pause this and like go back? Okay, let's go back. Uh, all right, well, what do you mean by code of ethics in this case? What, okay, if you can't. Um, Say the code of ethics, but there is a code of ethics when it comes to serving people with special yes. needs. So, so. It's, it's like the standards of care you would expect to receive as an, an individual. You want to ask a question? You don't want to ask a question? Okay. Um, um, so what makes this program versus... Um, you have an online program mm -hmm. for teaching people how to work with people with special needs versus being in, in a college uh, in a college setting learning this because um, I do know people that learned how to be DSPs and got their certification um, being a member of a college you know getting a certificate mm -hmm. so what is the difference between online learning in this case, and you know, because you know, this is like this is like similar to a nurse's aide. You can't learn to be a nurse or a nurse's aide online. It's right. impossible. Right. So, can you explain? 
So the the online aspect of the eBadge Academy is they've already experienced the the badge that they're applying for. Mm -hmm. um, Prior to earning that badge, we do a lot of training. Um, oh, you not, guys do do training, okay. Right, but it's it's not like a typical classroom setting. It's more individualized. So, you know, if you were going to be supporting person A, you would go through their plans, speak to their team. So uh, you work in conjunction with DSP, would work in conjunction with the service coordinator. The service coordinator, the guardian. The, and then look over their I, um, what do they call ISP? The, 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 they the would look at their individual service plan? So it's an ISA, yep, the yeah. individual service agreement. They would go over that, any behavior support plans, any <laughs> shared support plans, you know, any pertinent information to that person, you know, that can help the DSP. Okay. Do's and don'ts of being a DSP, like certain things. Setting boundaries is important because, uh, look, journalism, like we do, is not nine to five. Um, it, you know, from the minute that DSP gets to their site, are there boundaries that need to be set? How does that work within? Um, I think the boundaries are set as you, as you learn about each other. As you go along. It's really case, it's really person by person. You can't set, not every single DSP will have the same boundaries as... Um, no, what I mean by boundaries in this case, like, oh, you can't call me, you know, so, and that 10 is, hours a day, you know, I'm not a family member of your, you know what I'm saying? That's entirely up to the DSP on their own. Yeah. Is, Generally, giving out your personal cell phone is probably not the best, but some DSPs do do that, and they do it at their own risk because there is no, there is, there's, you can't say that your person will not call you 10 times in one day. So it's really what the DSP is comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as that boundary, then yes, it's, it's New by- New York State, for example, that's not allowed. Because if they work for a group home, mm -hmm. that's not allowed you know, giving out your personal information, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, so I guess it goes according to from state to state. It really does, the, the, yes. The right. Thing. Um, okay, so what, um, go through a scenario, uh, a typical training that a person who wants to become a DSP would get. Okay, so um, we have, so they meet with our HR coordinator, uh, Janet Gerbain. Mm -hmm. They go through Relias trainings online, such as HIPAA, um, <sighs> rights and responsibilities. Um, they go through a medical the training, one. the neglect and abuse. Ne neglect and abuse. Mm -hmm. It's about an eight hour day of online mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. And then they would go to orientation, um, which Elizabeth Walters, Marilyn Carter, and uh, the nurses. Mm -hmm. Typically, you know, they all have pieces and parts of that. Mm -hmm. And then um, after that, you know, they begin working, and then we would schedule like a person centered training with Brenda Donnelly. Mm -hmm. Person centered so. training, what exactly is that? Uh, Person-centered is making sure the person you're supporting is leading the life they want to live. That it's about them and not about the person that supports them. So teaching them. them how to be independent, uh, as independent as possible. As independent as possible, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, is the DSP uh, position, how long has it been in the, you know, how long has it been in the position? Because I know that... Um, years ago, like for example, during institutional days, mm -hmm. there was probably no such thing as a DSP. So how long has it been since DSP has been? So when Brandon Training School was closed in 1993, okay, um, a lot of the the people that were in the were institutionalized were then you know out in the community becoming parts of the community. Um, so it's been, you know, 20, 10, 
20, 20 years mm -hmm. since it's, it's been a position, no more like probably 25. But you no know, one's really rec recognized it. You know, As no one's doing now. Right, right. Yeah. So they're, they're more recognizing it now yes. than they were years ago. Yes. We're, we're trying to get the, the DSP as like a, a professional, like an RN would be. You know, we're trying to get it more recognized. Okay, so, so DSP, does a DSP person, um, is it like a nurse's aide, like a person would go into somebody's home if they need, if they needed to be given a shower, give them a shower, or they needed to learn how to cook something, they, you guys do that. What exactly, how does that work as far as what the DSP does? Um, so like Brandy said, it's it's really based on the person that they're supporting. I mean, we, we have some, some people that need help with cooking and cleaning. We have some people that need medication assistance. You know, it, it is all really, like person centered, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's person centered planning, pretty much. Yes, yes, it's all based on that individual. You know, um, if if they need help showering, you know, ADLs, whatnot. Assistive daily living skills. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, does Vermont have um, group homes, and if so? Do, do DSPs work in the group homes, or is it mainly going into someone's home and doing this job? So, as far as I'm aware, there are very little group homes mm -hmm. now. Um, in Vermont? In Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a group home, per se. Mm -hmm. um, other agencies do. As far as that goes, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if they have people that are staffed 24 seven or, or how that goes. Mm -hmm. But to, um, I believe it's, you know, they're, they staff it 24 seven and so they have like- basically are, in a sense, personal care aides. Yes, you're DSPs, but in a sense, you're a personal care aide to the person, right? Am I wrong in saying that? Um, that I've never heard that. I never heard a, D, a DSP be called that. Um, well, you're helping somebody do something, so you're. It, we're helping. Care. It is personal quick care, but it's in a whole different direction. It's more but of a how, quality so what, of what, life. What? what so, how does this come? Okay. What I mean, okay. For example, home health and hospice, or agencies like that in Vermont, they go in, and if a person needs house cleaning. They have somebody, it's called a PCA. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. PCA, personal care person. So the difference between a PCA and a DSP, what is the, is there any specific difference uh, versus each position? Well, I mean, in my own opinion, I feel like a PCA is there to, you know, provide the medication, provide the, the bathing, the feeding, the dressing, the cleaning. And yes, the DSP could potentially do that too, depending on the person and if they they need that care. But a DSP's job is also to provide a quality of life, to, to help support somebody in the best way that they possibly could. A PCA could do that too, absolutely. But I feel like that is- But you're not, a DSP doesn't do everything for that person you, you during the shift, they do. So again, person to person, if somebody needs help, if they cannot bathe themselves, if they cannot dress themselves, if they cannot feed themselves, if they cannot toilet by themselves, a direct support professional would do all of those things for that person mm -hmm. on their shift. When their shift is done, then it would become the shared living provider that is their job for the rest of the evening into the morning until the shift starts again. Okay, what's, yes. what's the shared in this case? So if you say that, and there's a cross, so what's a shared living provider? Um, that's a person, I guess, who gives the house to a person with a special need? Yes, it's, yes. it's, it's. Well, they, they open their home mm -hmm. to, to a person in need. Um, and then that, that home becomes their home as well. It's, it's not just the SLP's home, it's, you know, it's their home too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, I asked this question of all my guests. Uh, what are some misconceptions around, now, now that you said you're 
you've been a DSP for a while. What are some misconceptions around people with special needs when you first meet them? You understand the question? Like the misconceptions around working with people with special needs or, you know, between high function and low function. Yeah, you know, I've heard uh, a lot of stories, never never with me and my lady that I supported, but a lot of stories about um, how people would make comments about why is our, you know, our tax dollars going to you just sitting at McDonald's or just going to do laundry or, or um, why do you say, sitting, what do you mean sitting at McDonald's? I don't know. Well, because in a lot of the times, people um, and their supports like to go out for coffee. That's fun. You socialize. You're out in the community. Mm -hmm. um, some of the bystanders out in the community feel like that is not what should be happening with the money that um, they say comes from their tax dollars. But what they're not seeing is what this does for their social, what this does for the community. But what this if, here's the scenario, mm -hmm. what if that you being a DSP, mm -hmm. what if that is the only social outlet, you get my point there? If, if let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if, if, if you were working with us, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. husband and wife, you working with us and say, okay, we want to go to a restaurant. But if that was our only social outlet mm -hmm. for that week or that month or whatever, we go out, we treat ourselves to a restaurant and you go with us and you socialize with us, I don't see the, I don't see the correlation, the, the problem with that thing that, <clears throat> that person said about McDonald's, but right. if, that, if that's the only social, so <clears throat> what is your opinion on that? But again, they don't understand. They don't understand the, what we do. They don't, the they can't, they, exactly. They can't even understand uh -huh. what or why somebody would need a support support person. Mm -hmm. um, and especially like you said, versus high functioning and, and uh, Low, lower, lower functioning. functioning. Um, when when somebody is higher functioning, they seem to a bystander that does not know anything um, about what we do. They seem like they would be able to be okay on their their own. Well, low functioning person just means maybe the person might learn different. And exactly, like but yeah. and unfortunately, a lot of the world goes by what they see. Mm -hmm. So if they see somebody that looks like they're high functioning, they're gonna be like, why do they need a support? But if they see somebody that is a little bit more lower functioning, they will understand. So it's uh -huh. more or less, those comments are geared towards the more high functioning uh -huh. people, um, because again, they don't know the whole story. Have you, have you seen the field, this goes to both of you, have, uh -huh. have, have you seen the field change um, for the better, for the work? Of, of their changes that you think in the field of special needs, being a DSP or service coordinator, um, that, you know, or something that you see wrong in the field that you think might need to be changed? Yes, no? Um, I think people need to be more understanding of, you know, persons with disabilities. Um, I've seen mild changes of, you know, the community being more open and more welcoming to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's changed a lot. Um, mm -hmm. We're not where we should be, but we're going in the right direction. I definitely... What do you mean by we're not where we should be? You know, a person is a person, whether, you know, we look different or we act different or function different. Mm -hmm. We're all people and, you know, individuals and we need to be treated with respect and kindness. Okay. Knowing that we're in this current administration, mm -hmm. politic question, knowing that we're in a current administration and things are being cut left and right, you know, Medicaid, uh, uh, um, you know, nursing care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is one thing that you can say to, uh, you know, knowing that you've been in the field for so long, um, you know, that this field uh, of, of having someone support somebody else, right? Why is it so important for things like this not to be cut, you know, as far as uh, 
services? Because everyone deserves the same quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone deserves to be doing as much as they can to the best of their ability. You know, and if that means someone needs to help them, then that's what needs to happen so that they can be part of their community and really be involved. Okay. You know? um, years ago, DSP, uh, well, the, the minimum wage has changed, mm -hmm. or certain states, the minimum wage is changing. Um, the, you know, now it's about fifteen, sixteen dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. Years ago, DSPs used to get paid less than that, seven, eight dollars an hour. Um, should it be a certain wage, or should it be higher because of the fact that you're working with in uh, an infirm, or I shouldn't say infirm, but a population that. You know the elderly, the disabled. Uh, um, that's a, should it be higher? Um, for example, food service. You're working with hot things, hot pots. Uh, it it it's a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know they've raised the the minimum wage for that because uh, of the environment. So, um, so your take on, on the minimum wage and DSPs? So I, I believe that DSPs should get a fair wage for what they do. Mm -hmm. That being said, a, a lot of the DSPs that we have um, that work for us, they're, they're not in it for the paycheck. They're, they're in a lot it of from, are not because from their hearts, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. they, they truly love what they're doing. Um, but some people, and I've done research, some people have left the field because it's not a high-paying position. Mm -hmm. You have a family to feed. Absolutely. You, you and, know. Right, so. and, and we understand that. And um, our agency, to the best of our abilities, give you know what we think is a sufficient wage along with some pretty amazing benefits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and we also offer a lot of training and support for people who are hired as DSPs. Okay, um, so the training is eight hours. Mm -hmm. um, there's further trainings outside of the eight hours, right? Absolutely. Because the eight hours seems to me that it's the same because it's for a security guard, eight and 16 hour training, you know, depends mm -hmm. on the state. but. Um, how f how much further does that training go? Like, um, on the job training type of thing. Um. So, Josh believes that you know if you want to continue your education, you know, ask ask to go to a training. Um, we've sent several DSPs to New Orleans, mm. um, where they attended some um, conferences to better their knowledge and to see what the rest of the United States is doing as far as DSP work and institutions. No, what I mean is, um, like, does a person shadow, in other words, if I wanted to be a DSP, mm -hmm. well, I can't because there's, um, well, I could, but I don't drive. We can work around that. But if I wanted to be a DSP, would you send me along with someone to shadow that person and what they, that's what I mean, besides going to training, mm -hmm. Uh -huh. in different states. Would you send me to shadow somebody or to, to you know, um, on a particular day? Uh -huh. So, like you said, with, with the wage concern, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it is that you are hired and you read as much as you can. We give you as much information as we can and you go work with your person. You know, um, if there is a time that we can offer job shadowing, absolutely, but sometimes it's a matter of, you know, the person has been without support for, you know, weeks or, or sometimes oh, even more, yeah. you know? Yeah. So there's, besides the team that's currently there, mm -hmm. you know, there is no 
Well, the shared living provider will also help a lot with that role because they're with the person um, more Did than. I ask the wrong, person, wrong question. No, 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 you didn't ask the wrong question. Job shadowing would be the Ideal. team's input, would be the service coordinator and the guardian um, and the shared living provider. Now, when the DSP goes to start their um, shift at the home, because that's where you would typically start to pick up the person, um, the shared living provider provider would more than likely give you a lot of information about the routine and what they like, what they do dislike. But like Chelsea said, you do, that's all in a lot of plans over and over again, um, the same thing. So it's repetitive, so you remember. So it's repetitive meeting. It is very repetitive. The, and also, so. as, as far as training, um, we do monthly supervisions with DSPs because um, we need to know how to support them as well as support the person that they support. We need to support everybody. And um, at Humans Change, we change every single day. So to say that we can provide all the training all at once would be um, untrue because every month we, if they need training on this, we'll find that training. If, they need, if we see that they need um, training in a certain aspect, we'll find that training for them and we will get them into that. And so we keep our DSPs very knowledgeable on what they need to best support that person. Okay. Now, in terms of, because um, we only have a short time left, uh, the future of the field of disabilities and um, DSPs, because like, as you said, um, there weren't really DSPs during Brandis training school days. Mm -hmm. But how do you see the field evolving? Um, I think as... For the future of... As more states recognize the closing of institutions, you know, across the country, I think there's going to be a higher need. Because I understand now, in the research I've done, that we've done, 39 states are still institutionalizing mm -hmm. in different aspects. Uh, there are certain states that still have work, job workshops or in the, uh, employment piece work stuff. So, um, you know, I mean, we just need to recognize that people need to be more dependent. Um, yes, it, okay, it, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. You know, a lot of people are so prideful we're asking for help that a lot of people don't probably don't want a DSP. And like you said, there's misconceptions. So how do we put this all in a nutshell and say that, you know, having a DSP is important. There's nothing wrong with asking for help, you know, but a lot of people are so, what happens if a person, you might think that they might need a DSP. So do you guys go, and talk to the family, or the family comes to you? How does that work? So uh, when typically to, when uh, someone comes to Green Mountain Support Services requesting help, um, we go through an intake process to see, we do a needs assessment to see where the person's at in life and to see if they could benefit from some community support hours, which would be provided by a DSP. And that is how Is this funded by Medicaid or this is funded by um, is DSP or having a worker, is it mainly funded by Medicaid it's, or another yes. source? Yes, yeah, okay. Medicaid dollars are used for DSPs, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, now, um, do I ask questions? Do I ask questions? Okay, uh, what, um, it, um, now, in terms of service coordinator, uh, what is your, all right, so you meet with the family, okay? Mm -hmm. And how long is that process? Is that a couple of months, a couple of weeks? How long does it usually um, take? The intake process usually takes roughly about four, four weeks, mm -hmm. you know, to, to meet the people, um, get the funding going, get an ISA started, get all the required paperwork, um, if the person was with an agency prior to coming to us, mm -hmm. you know, we talk to that agency, get all the documentation. You, you're t what is the best thing about being a DSP? Pros and cons, <laughs> the, the good things and the bad things about being a 
direct, before, direct support professional? The best thing for me, and I, I can only tell you my opinion, is the work that I'm doing. It's, it's as much as you don't think that you would form a bond, you do form a bond. And it's just, you're giving back. You're giving something to somebody that they might not have had without you. And that is, that's fulfillment. That's fulfillment for them. That's fulfillment for you. It's a very rewarding, very rewarding profession. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yes. Your take on it? Um, when you emailed me the question about what is a DSP, mm -hmm. my immediate thought was, what doesn't a DSP do? You yeah. know. Okay. So if I phrase that wrong, so what? Uh, yeah. So your your take in being in the field, the, the best thing that you've dealt with or had to deal with or? Um, the best thing is when you see a person working towards the goal and then they're able to complete that goal in life without any assistance. You know, they're, they're able to independently, you know, go to work or, you know, something similar to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the way their face lights up, mm -hmm. you know, when they know that they Oh my goodness! I just did this great thing, and you're or there. Like if a DSP teaches somebody, or someone, let's say somebody wants to learn how to drive a car, and then they turn around and um, get their license, they get their car. You, you might help them at the car dealership, um, ask questions, those mm -hmm. things. So, I guess if you teach somebody how to be more independent mm -hmm. and not so in other words, after they achieve their goals, does the DSP go away, or how, how does that work? So the DSP, no, the DSP no. does not go away. No. So you set yearly, in the ISA, you set yearly goals. And those goals are supposed to be um, worked on on a daily basis. And so that's, that's more or less what Chelsea was referring to, is you start off with goals that they, they haven't reached yet. And over time, monthly home visits, you see them out in the community. Over time, you see progress. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of the year, if they reach that goal, it's success. And that's really what we're all looking for in life mm -hmm. is to just be successful. So that feeling of watching it from the beginning to the end, that's an, that's an amazing it's like thing. A mother, it's like a mother watching their child crawl it for the first it, time. And Absolutely. honestly, it is. Yes. If that's how, I mean, there's so many emotions put into mm -hmm. it, that is a great way to put it. Right. Well, another way to put it, you have to, somebody has to crawl first before they can walk. Right, so, absolutely. Um, if, it, if, for example, because I've been a Special Olympic coach before in other, st other instances, you know, when someone's learning to play basketball for the first time, and then you teach them that particular thing, then they make the basket, you're happy for them because they've achieved the goal, you know? And working in teams, being a DSP, you have to work in teams, mm -hmm. like you said. you have So you have the service coordinator, DSP. Who else do you have the, um, besides the, those, the, the family members? Um, so in the, in the team, you would have the family members, um, the person you're supporting, the direct support professional, um, service coordinator, guardian, and, you know, if they have work, the work supports would be involved. The employer. Right. Um, sometimes. Because um, something as simple, like in terms of, last question, sir, something as simple in terms of what a DSP does. Um, like helping someone, if, a D, if the employer says to the DSP, um, I need you to help me teach this person how to be, uh, um, come to the job on time, or maybe teach them a better route to get to the job on time. Does the DSP help with that? Oh, absolutely. Can you help with job coaching? Job yes. coaching. Oh, so yes. yeah. It's one because a lot of agencies have job coach, DSP. So <clears throat> DSP is everything rolled into one. Right. So we do have a supported employment 
department at Green Mountain Support Services. Mm -hmm. um, they supervise the DSPs along with the service coordinators and whatever um, work goals or whatever it is at work that the person is struggling with, we all meet as a team to support not only the direct support professional, but the person they're supporting as well. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Able to Learn Air. We'd like to, uh, we would like to thank our main sponsor, Green Mountain Support Services, Champlain Community Services, and Washington County Mental Health. This puts an end to this edition. Uh, we'd like to thank Green Mountain Support Services again. Uh, real quick, before we really end, um, is there a number that, uh, number of website? Yes, if you call 888-7602, you will get our office. And if you go to gmssi.org, okay. you will find us on the web. For more information on Green Mountain Support Services, you can reach them at 802-876-802-888. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 802-888-7602 or www.gmss. SI.org. This puts an end to this edition of A Bulldog on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time for the next exciting edition of A Bulldog on Air. See you next time. Ableton On Air major sponsorship was given by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Also sponsorship was given by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together, and Champlain Community Services of Vermont.